The Early Weigh-In Podcast is back, and this weekend is UFC 254. We have Habib Nurmagomedov and Justin Gaethje fight for the undisputed lightweight title. And special week, Ty and I decided to finally get your poster frame back here and put this up for you guys. So this is what you guys are in the drawing for. Uh, it is autographed by Matt Brown, by Robbie Lawler. You have Anthony Johnson, uh, Josh Clay Thompson, Guida. Clay Guida, multiple high, uh, you know, good names on there. So from going forward, we decided, uh, since we can't see a lot of the subscribers, uh, any comment below in the comment section um, from here until maybe the end of the year or something or until we hit 100 subscribers there, anytime, any comment in the name, we are going to put you in a hat in the running for a drawing. Um, just a quick little recap of last week, man. You know, we got to know uh, we are coming off the worst night of betting um, UFC history for us in the podcast. Um, but man, just to touch on a couple of, you know, the malarkey fight, I thought we were on the receiving end of a, a bad decision there. And, you know, I, I didn't really argue too much, uh, with our parlay getting ruined with the Gamrot decision, but it is a little salty when you get the fighter up there claiming that he didn't even think he won. So two bad little decisions there. And then we we're off by half a round on that Grisham finish. And maybe somebody I look to fake from here on out because he didn't look that good. He did not. Um, and then I have no idea how you don't call the Jim Young Park fight, man. He set the, the record for most ground strikes. It was 15 minutes, 13 and a half of the 15 minutes was pure domination. I don't know how that fight was stopped. And man, Claudio Silva was absolutely lost on the feet when he couldn't get that takedown, man, at all. James Krause looked pretty good, man. He uh, did, even on the bum knee and stuff. James Krause looked very, uh, very good. And I love the post fight talk about fighting Buckley up 185. James Krause's game, man. That is cool. That is cool. Just kind of breaking down some of those fights on the card. Start with Saeed and Nurmagomedov. He actually looked like a minus 400 favorite. Yeah, there. man. Uh, I know whenever we were going in, we, we actually, you know, kind of faded in by playing a Mark Striegel submission mm -hmm. and. That did not work out well for us either. Um, now, we already talked a little bit about the Max and Grisham fight. Future fade, for yeah. sure. He just he just wasn't up to par. Uh, we touched on the Malarkey fight as well. Again, I do think that it was a bad decision. It's not the worst one I've ever seen yeah. in my life, but it, I don't know, like 10 plus minutes of control time on the ground, it's kind of hard to justify yeah, him losing a fight. I remember texting you in the last two rounds of 10 minutes there, Malarkey was over six minutes of control time. That doesn't win you the last two rounds, man. I don't really know what that is. Right, right. Um, you know, Jun Young Park should have been stopped. Uh, we, we missed it, but, you know, I'm not too upset about that. Uh, Gillian Robertson dominated in the wrestling match. Yeah, so she did pump up that uh, stat for control time even more, you know. She, uh, she, looks, she looks really, really good. Uh, now, uh, Guram, close fight, but uh, once again, we're not really arguing about the decision. It just, it makes it sting a little bit more whenever he's even admitting that it wasn't his fight. Uh, Jonathan Martinez looks solid, man. man he did. He, he pumped the cab out there really, really well. He didn't let Thomas Almeida draw him into the brawl that some people let him get into, and he's really stayed composed. Uh, I was, you know, I was uh, back and forth on that fight when it ended up leaning toward Thomas Almeida, just, uh, you know, uh, the short notice and stuff, Martinez took it on, but he looks like a guy that stays ready almost to an extent, man. He surprised me on Saturday. Uh, we, we talked about James Krause a little bit. Uh, Silva, he just is lost out there if he can't get it to the mat. And, you know, I really thought that the, I really thought that it would come into play, but, but Kraus just, he did what he needed to. I don't really have much more to say than that, but he, he did what he needed to. Uh, Jim yeah, Crew. Yeah, man. I, I called it by sub, but I knew that was just going to be an absolute steamrolling, man. Um, the guy's crew fault compared to Modesta's. Uh, I mean, Jim Crew is a legit prospect at 24 years old in that or light heavyweight division. I agree. Um, I was all over Jessica Andraj. She was just too powerful for she Kate was, Chuka again. To an extent, I was I was all right with how Chuk was fighting. She she tried to keep it long and stuff. She she did get taken down a couple times with the power of Andraj, but um, I, I played Chuk earlier in the week uh, before the retirement talk started coming out and stuff. And going into fight night, I really wasn't too confident over and. After those two body shots, man, she she's definitely retired. I, I agree. Um, now, I was all over Ortega. I didn't expect him to outbox the Korean zombie for five rounds, but he did 
it's, you know, improve his skill set tenfold over those two years that he took off. And, and being under 30, I think that, that was exactly what he needed at this point in his career. Yeah, man, I couldn't agree more. I was, I wanted to crawl in bed and, and cry after that one. I was, I was pretty high on the Korean zombie. And I mean, man, he went out there and looked super gun shy. And if you've seen his Instagram post after he took that elbow, he says he has no recollection of the next three rounds. And you could tell he was just on autopilot, you know, and, but you don't ever see the Korean zombie a gunshot like that. So um, Ortega definitely went in there and threw him off with his game plan and stuff. And um, I don't want to take nothing away from Brian and, and you know say the Korean zombie looked bad because Brian looked really, really good on Saturday night. And with that performance, it really puts him into the discussion of maybe getting a, a title shot. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the next move is definitely You can't run in and max back again um, after – two close fights like that. You got to give a break before Max and Volkanovski right. running back. So yeah, I think uh, Brian without a doubt gets the next title shot. All right, so we're going to move on to the prelims. Uh, we start off with El Fenomeno, Joel Alvarez, who is 17 and 2, versus the Thunder of the North, Alexander Yakolev, who is 25, 10 and 1. Uh, both these guys extremely big for the position. Right, absolutely. Six foot three, you just don't, ex you expect one of them to have a high advantage in any fight that they're mm -hmm. in. And it's just kind of, it's going to be kind of neat seeing these two huge sure. lightweights. I know that they're going to look like 170s mm -hmm. in there. Um, Joel Alvarez, he's coming off of his first round submission of uh, Joe Duffy, the McGregor killer. Yeah. I, uh, I know that the odds makers definitely didn't expect that to happen, mm -hmm. but uh, we see now that he's getting a little bit more respect. And the, the respect that I think he deserves, especially having 15 of his seven win, 17 wins by uh, submission, the other two by KO. Yeah. You know, he's a finisher. And, uh, he looks good. I think he's going to be a problem in the lightweight division. Um, now, something about Joel Alvarez is whenever he starts the fight, he's already comfortable. For being 27 years old, he's really calm inside the pocket. It doesn't mind getting started early with kicks and strikes, although that that's not his game plan right. necessarily. Um, he, I will say that even though he is comfortable with striking range, he has a problem with kind of keeping his head on the center line and being susceptible to overhands. Yeah. And uh, I, I expect Alexander Yakolev to, to kind of lean on that. Now, he's been in there with some of the best, uh, including Damian Maya and Kamara Usman, and was able to avoid getting finished by either one of them. So it really brings into the question, you know, is he going to get subbed by the 27-year-old if he didn't get subbed by Damian Maya? And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but... At a minus 155, Alvarez looks pretty good right now. I, I think that there's some value on him. Um, a little, you know, a little fun fact that I found out. <laughs> Yakovlev is a famous Russian rapper who's released over three albums. <laughs> and if you look him up on YouTube, uh, he's got videos of him riding around in G-Wagons carrying K-47s. And it's it's wild, man. Much better than T-Wood. Right? Much better than T-Wood. <laughs> so, man, uh, for me... I think that minus 155 line is super tasty on the Joel Alvarez part as it opened up as a minus 285. So I think people expect him to win this fight here. And one of the reasons I think they expect him to win this fight is uh, Yakolev just got off the loss to to Roosevelt Roberts. And Joel Alvarez is a super, super good comparison to him. He's a long, lanky, over six foot lightweight. And Yakolev really, really had trouble in implementing his game plan. Every single time he shot, um, Roosevelt was super good at wrapping up the neck and threatening the guillotine. He was having to turn belly down and stuff, and Roosevelt could take, you know, top control there. And that was something that I really look for Joel Alvarez to implement in this game plan, being as nice of a submission artist as he is. Um, being, you know, the submission artist, we've seen this guy go out and add, like, new techniques to his arsenal. He throws a really, really good head kick, um, calf kick, man, his push kick is really good, so we're... He's a young guy that we're seeing, I think, uh, improve every time he's in the octagon and, and um, add tools to his arsenal um, to really see the improvement. Now, he's got the one blemish on his UFC record, but it's to Demir. Uh, I don't even, it, yeah, to Demir is Magulov, who was 17-1 and and 3-0 and in the UFC, and that's where I saw him have trouble with the overhand rice as well. He <laughs> tends to, to have the James Vick kind of tall man defense to where he, he relies on his arms to kind of push him away or, you know, the head to kind of, just rely on the head movement alone, and it kind of cost him. Granted, he didn't get put away, but, you know, Yakolev's also a big guy, and he comes in there with some power. On Yakolev's side, man, 
He's been a pro since 2004. He's an absolute vet, but man, from 2004 to 2010, he didn't beat a single guy with a winning record. He had three attempts at it and lost all three of them. This guy is just a guy, if he can't lay and pray on you, he doesn't really offer much to you. He's really slow on the feet. We saw Damian Maya drop him with an overhand left. And Damian, I mean, it's a much younger Damian Maya, but somebody that's not ever really known for striking, you right. know. And, and there's a couple things that I see Yoel Alvarez do really well that um, plays into how uh, victories and, you know, the paths that I see for him. Uh, so I really think Yoel Alvarez is, is going to wrap the neck on one of the takedowns. Um, but I also saw, man, uh, Yakovlev, every time that Roosevelt Roberts would faint, he ducks off, man, to his left. And I really think that the right high kick is there, which is another thing that I've seen Yoel Alvarez really, really improve his game on. And so, man, um, you know, I think the minus 285 was a little steep. I think the odds makers, when they saw him cash as a plus, like, 260 dog or something, you know, they, they kind of weighed their decision. But at minus 155, I, I love this Alvarez pick. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you talked about the uh, Roosevelt Roberts fight. Yakovlev, he did almost get guillotined one time he shot in the mm-hmm. third round against Roosevelt yeah. Roberts. And I think that that plays right into Joel Alvarez's game. He ha- kind of has a... Um, a striking where he stands tall and almost invites a takedown so that he can wrap that up. Now, the one thing that I am worried about is Yakovlev getting the takedown and Alvarez being comfortable playing on his back. Yeah, just uh, wasting too much time. Yeah, so I could, I could see um, Yakovlev pull out a decision by just lay and praying. Like you said, uh, I, I do think that Joel is so comfortable off of his back because of his submission uh, victories that it could bite him in the ass, but with this value, it's really hard to pass up, and I think that we'll end up playing into the podcast. So, on board with that one, man, and we move to our first uh, ladies' fight of the night in the women's flyweight division. We have Liana Jojo, who's 8-3, fighting the UFC debut, and Miranda Maverick, who's 7-2. And, and, and man, um, you know, outside of Jojo's arm bar, she really doesn't have much to offer girls, man. Uh, she She's not that solid on the feet. Um, and she really has to implement her jiu-jitsu game plan uh, because you know, she she really lacks in the wrestling department. And we really saw Sarah Murata, like really, really expose her there. And then you got the newcomer, in, uh, Miranda Maverick, who was 6-1 and one as an amateur, made her pro debut in Invicta. So they got a lot of hype around this girl, man, and um, a ton of potential. And at age 23... I mean, opening as a minus 420, that's a little bit wild in my opinion. You know, this, she's, both girls are still very, very green. Mm-hmm. Uh, where well, she opened, I'm sorry, as a minus 140, which is definitely what I would have been playing. But now right. as a minus 420, it's just like, that's just one of those one of those girl fights where you're looking, you know, to, to just, for something to bite you in the ass and something to go wrong like we've seen recently. You know? I almost wouldn't even want to put her in a parlay with those odds. Yeah. I think that she'll lose out on a lot of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a pass for me just because we've gotten burned on some girl fights here. But without a doubt, in my opinion, I think Brandon Maverick is the much more well-rounded fighter. But who knows, man? We've seen like three or four Georgian underdogs come out here and get the job done. Uh, exactly. Now, you know, you talked about Joju. Her, her pass to victory are the submission game. Um, whenever it's on the feet, she looks very amateurish in her striking, and uh, it, it's shown in all of her bouts. Now, the uh, Miranda Maverick, she's definitely coming in with some momentum on a five-fight win streak if you're including exhibition matches, which, in my book, those are those are just as important. Um, now, you know, I think that Miranda Maverick has a the ability to get the fight to the ground and dominate there as well but i would completely avoid it just because that is there is yeah that is mm-hmm. jojo uh, jojo's only path to victory so even though i think that she can i think that she should stick to the outside utilize her low leg kicks and just pick her apart on the feet jojo is uh, you know she's shown a couple of times that she'll just give up in the middle of the fight and i, I think that that's what Maverick should shoot for. Um, I, I definitely would have liked her at a minus 140, but here, it's again, it's a pass. Next fight of the night, or is that one for you? Yeah. Taking yeah. out, that's another exciting. So uh, the prospect, which, you know, at 27 years old, there's a time where that nickname, <laughs> <laughs> you might want to reconsider it. But Nathaniel Wood at 17 and 4 versus Casey Kenny, who was 15, 2 and 1. Uh, Kenny coming off maybe the most dominant performance in recent UFC history against uh, Haile Altang. Yeah. Um, 
he he was a minus three ninety in there, so he should have done what he did. But still, it's kind of it's kind of insane that he got an opponent where he could showcase every single bit of his skills and look dominant the entire fifteen minutes. Uh, something that I don't necessarily like was that that was less than a month ago, and it's a quick turnaround to go all the way to a decision, even though you were so dominant and and be right back in there. That being said, this will be his 14th fight since the beginning of 2017. So Casey Kinney is uh, as active as it is. Right, yeah. right. It's it's nothing new to him. Um, you know, his only lot Casey Kinney's only loss in the past three years are coming to Mirab, who, you know, I think it scored 12 of 24 takedowns, and he's just relentless with that right. pressure. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, and uh, Mirab's showing that in all of his fights, but. Since that 2017 loss, he's had wins over Brandon Royval, Ray Borg, Manny Bermudez, and Luis Smolka. And I think that that just speaks to the level of competition that Casey Kenny can beat. And I'm not really saying that Nathaniel Wood is... Uh, I would say he's as good as the guys that I just mentioned. You know what I'm saying? But he's no better than any right. of them. Um, I think Casey Kenny, as far as his striking... Maybe the fastest dude in the division. He really has lightning speed, and it, it's uh, it's impressive. I, I really am just excited to get to see him back into the cage, and I feel like I'm getting a treat just seeing him as early as this, you know, right after that dominant performance. Um, Nathaniel Wood, he's coming off his win against John Castaneda, uh, where he was a minus 410, so he should have won that one as well. He, uh, you know, he, he's coming off that... Uh, before that, he was coming off the loss to John Dodson, which really slowed down his hype train. Yeah. And I think, you know, taking that loss to John Dodson at Dodson's point in his career, it's tough to look past it, you know? And I think Do Dodson offers a lot of uh, weapons offensively, and it's not to say that he's a bad fighter by any means. It's just, you know, at that point in his career, it's tough to take a loss like that. Um, now, some things that Nathaniel Wood does really good is he throws combinations maybe some of the best in the division. He has a great straight right that he'll catch a lot of people with. And uh, a mean Dar Sander and naked choke. So God forbid he gets on your back, he will take advantage of that. Um, you know, they opened relatively, you know, Nathaniel Wood was a plus 115 and Casey Kenny was a minus 145. I definitely wish we could have gotten Casey Kenny at those odds. Him closing in towards a minus 180, 185. I still feel like there's value in playing him, although I am a little bit put off on it. Yeah, man. So I'm right there with you. That's that's another one of those that I really wish we kept an eye on, man, when the thoughts first came out because of minus 155. I'm playing it all day. When it gets up there to the minus 185, it's it's getting out of an unplayable reach for me, you know. And this is such a close fight for me that if, if Nathaniel Wood gets above 200, this is the business of making money, man, and a plus 200 – Dog odds on Nathaniel Wood is something I would almost never pass on. Right. Um, that being said, man, Kenny is coming off the absolute performance of a lifetime. We've never seen him look, you know, that good, period. But, I mean, I hate that these guys are fighting what they are, man. They're both 4-1 and one in the UFC. They both, they're both two of the best prospects in the absolute stack of animal division right now. Um, but it is at the point in time where, you know, they're closing on that top 15 and the winner of this one right here probably gets him a pretty nice little high profile fight, man. Mm -hmm. um, Possibly like an O'Malley fight. An O'Malley return. fight, man, a statement fight, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, man. One of these guys are definitely going to be, I think, a 10 to 15 rated opponent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nathaniel Wood, Brad Pickett's prodigy and stuff, man. He's this little pupil and stuff. Uh, he fights very long. You touched on his straight right. It's a long straight right, man. He... he it's it's kind of karate style, but he's a wide base, and that that straight right covers a lot of distance. And almost like a corner left. Almost like a corner left, absolutely. Um, that's something that worries me because Casey Kenny started judo at five five years old. He's a nine time judo national champion. This guy has serious ground skills. Some you know I'm not discrediting the thing of Woods back takes because they're very impressive, but I think Casey really will be able to dominate in the grappling exchanges. Maybe not if it's on the mat, but wrestling, you know, clinch, scrambles, it's all leaning toward Casey Kenny, in my opinion. Um, you know, that being said, man, I don't want him to go out there and I don't want him to go out there and be so starstruck from his last performance and just get so sold on, uh, you know, his striking. Um, 
And, you know, I don't want him to fall in love with that striking and stuff, because that's not Casey Kenny. I think he was gifted with opponent that let that shine. And he's not gifted with that opponent here. I think he's going to need to mix up this game um, to really get this job done. It's a, it's a close fight, man. Uh, I just think you, you know, you touched on the level of competition that Casey's been in there with. He was the LFA flyweight and bantamweight champion. Um, if this gets below a, a minus 165, 170, I'm probably going to play it. Um, I like Casey Kenny to get this done. Probably be a decision, but maybe a little dominant decision. Man. Where, you, where are the odds sit right now? How do you lean? How do you feel? I still definitely lean Casey Kenny, and it's just out of playable reach. Um, it's it's got to slip a little bit, man. I'm telling you, uh, at minus one. Yeah, um, it would have, but Nathaniel Wood does offer those problems, and you know, like I said, I think Nathaniel is the better striker of the two, just pure striker, and I don't want him to fall in love with the striking ability and try to stand in there with Nathaniel for 15 minutes, because he has potential to lose that if he does. 100%. Man, our next fight of the night, we have Dalton Jones, who's 13-2, and two, taking on Smiling Sam Alvey, who's 33-14, and 14, and uh, I know you'll touch on these odds a little bit because I know that was something we had talked about earlier in the week. Don Jones is a huge favorite right now. So he's 2-0 and in the UFC, but he's fought Mike Rodriguez and Katus Abragamov. And Abragamov, four-fight losing streak, not even in the UFC anymore. And, you know, Mike Rodriguez just got his light shut out, bed Herman and stuff, man. So. Got subbed, right? Yeah, I mean, got <laughs> subbed, but I mean. Ed Herman's not somebody you should be losing to at this point in Ed Herman's career when and you're Mike Rodriguez. To be fair, I think that that fight should have been stopped. It right? was definitely in weird circumstances, but Mike Rodriguez is not a guy that I think should be losing to Ed Herman. Right. Um, so, you know, that being said, I don't want to take away from his wins. I think Donald Jones is a pretty impressive prospect in the fight heavyweight division. He's got some really, really good size. and. He's on a 12-fight win streak right now. I, I know I texted you earlier in the week, and I was like, do you know who his last loss was? And it's to Roki Martinez, which is a guy that I think the UFC didn't even weigh appropriate correctly. Because <laughs> when he stepped in there with Romanov, man, he's huge. Uh, did not carry the weight well, but that's the last guy to beat Donald John. But Donald John, man, of that 12-fight win streak, he has now finished seven in a row. He's got a very, very heavy right hand. Um... Man, on the feet, he's going to be twice as fast as Sam Alvey. Sam Alvey is just known for uh, low volume and putting his back on the fence as recently. He he moved up to light heavyweight, got them two wins over Prochneo and Delonte. Since then, it's dropped like his last four in a row mm -hmm. or something. Now, Sam Alvey did make, uh, what's his name, Gunshy in that last fight, Ryan, Ryan Spann, Spann, you know. Yeah. So, you know, he offers a ton of power in that left hand. Um, and he's as tough as can be, man. He's got 14 losses, and 10 of those are by decision. Sam Alvey's a hard guy to put away, um, and he needs a win bad here, man. So, you know, I don't want to say he's the liveest dog on the card, but Sam Alvey um, can, you know, he's just one of those guys I don't want to count out, man. You just don't know what's going to happen with him. But Don Jun has plenty of things that I see um, that are going to play into, you know, a plenty of paths to victory for him against Sam Alvey. Sam Alvey is so slow, doesn't carry the weight well at heavyweight or light heavyweight. He's he's really just heavy on his feet, man. And uh, Don John can tear up that lead leg super, super bad. And and when Sam puts it back on the fence, man, it, I think he's a hard guy to take down. But I think Don John will be able to to get the double leg on the fence and put him down. Now, like I said, ten of the fourteen losses are by. Uh, by decisions. I don't know if I want to go Don John in seven distance by no means, but I, I like a nice little parlay with Don John. Uh, I don't mind that at all. You know, you talked about the odds a little bit. He opened, Don John opened at a minus 600 yeah. and has since moved to about a, a minus 350. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Mike Rodriguez win and the Igor Bramov win. Uh, the biggest takeaways from those fights is how calm he is inside the pocket, even when he's getting you know, a flurry is being put on him. Uh, I think Abragamov put together a 25-punch combo and Dao Jung ate it like, like there was nothing. So, you know, I, I think some things to note is that Jung has a chin, you yeah. know, and uh, he also has some great knees. He utilizes his jab and he really picks his shots and uh, waits for the opportunity to implement his straight right. He has a straight right that'll 
I mean, that KO'd Mike Rodriguez right. and, you know, realistically has more power than, than anybody else in that division. Um, Sam Albee, you know, he made that jump to light heavyweight. And I think that the win over Volante and Crack, you know, it gave him a little bit of sense of false hope. And, and since then, we've seen that he's, I don't want to say he's not UFC caliber, but he's a, uh, He's uh, maybe a gatekeeper is yeah. even too too far to say for him. You know, like maybe he should be welcoming some uh, some debutantes into the division. But other than that, I don't really see his place in the UFC. Um, you know, Sam Alvey, he banks on his opponents coming forward heavy and then being able to throw that lead right hook. Um, that's his that's his favorite shot is the lead right hook counter and. I don't think that Donald Jones is going to be reckless enough to fall into that game plan for Sam Alvey. Um, I, I imagine that Donald Jones is, is okay with keeping it on the feet, but if he does shoot on Sam Alvey, he's got to watch out for Sam Alvey's front chokes. He's got legitimate uh, submission threats whenever somebody's shooting for a takedown, and that's something that I would hope Donald Jones avoids. Um, that being said, Donald Jones, I think he's going to get it get it done inside the distance. You know. Ryan Spann couldn't do it. Um, I, I forget Sam Alvey's last four losses, but they couldn't do it. I just, I think Joan opening at a minus 600 and the inside the distance being at a minus 170 right now, I think there's some value on it because I really do think it's going to show that he is one of the upper echelon of the light heavyweight division, and I don't think Sam Alvey's going to be stopping it. Although, like you said, it is kind of tough to, to count out Sam, Sam Alvey because he's he's never out of the out right. of the fight. Absolutely. So I know we are in agreement, and I know we had probably talked about putting Jung in a parlay, so mm -hmm. that'll probably get released later on in the week. So I'm gonna take this next one because I know you're really excited about the uh, prelim main event here. But right before that, man, we have uh, Alex Oliveira, who's 22 and eight, versus the newcomer in Shavkat. Rachmanov, who still has a zero in his record, man, at 12-0, and 0, coming out of N1 Global. Uh, just to touch on the newcomer, man, I, uh, I'm i nervous about this fight. Um, I think you can you, know, you can really snag excellent odds on either one of the guys. Um, but, man, I think this just might be one of those one of those European fighters that maybe have flown underneath the radar, man, and stuff. I, I think this guy... Has has very good potential at, at six one in the in the one seventy division. Man, he's got great size uh, and phenomenal reach. Man, and it this it's no surprise when you when you go back and watch his fight. He he wants to fight on the mat. He's got ridiculous ground and pound, but he's he's got a very intelligent jab and stuff that he fights behind as well. Um, you know, this guy has has never fought a guy with a losing record in his entire even as an amateur and the 12 wins, it's nobody with a losing record. So it's not like this guy's fighting garbage cannons or anything. He's coming out of N1 Global. But that being said, he hasn't fought a lot in the cage. And, you know, we saw that uh, Paul Felder, you know, brought that up, and it really made a difference in Egger's fight. But that really only makes a difference when you have a person who's going to come out there and wrestle you, I think. And I don't know if Alex Oliveira is going to come out there and wrestle him. We've seen a real... Like Alex Oliveira 2.0 kind of as of late, going to decisions, you know, and being just not as wild with the strikes like he was in the Yancey fight and stuff like that. He's not throwing himself in the fire, not the kill or be killed kind of Alex Oliveira that we used to see. That unorthodox striking is super dangerous, man, and, and he's been in there. You know, I touched on uh, Shaftcat's record, but it, it doesn't hold, you know, hold a fire to the people that Alex Oliveira has been in with. He's got that real long karate stance that it's just unorthodox, man. You don't know what Alex Oliveira is going to throw at you. So I'm really curious to see um, how their grappling matches up with each other because I think Alex Oliveira takes the striking advantage. Shavkat wants this fight to the mat, and I'm curious to see how those grappling, uh, grappling exchanges take place. But just to go ahead and give my opinion, uh, I haven't officially played him yet. But I am going to go with the dog and the newcomer in Shavkat just because Alex Oliveira is so wild and you're going to get with him. A hundred percent. I think Alex Oliveira is, you know, Achilles heel to his fight games that he has a problem with getting into wars. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's going to be any different with Rachmanov. Um, there are a couple of losses that really hold weight in my head about Oliveira. Um, the losses to Mike Perry, Nicholas Dalby, uh, Yancy Madero's. Yeah. I mean, those are those weigh heavy on me, and I, I really I don't think that 
Uh, I think that all those guys are uh, comparable, at least, to Rachmanov, even though we haven't seen Rachmanov in the UFC cage. Um, Oliveira, you know, he he's good at countering on rushing fighters, and he, like you mentioned, he doesn't really use his grappling like he did back in his older UFC days. Um, where Rachmanov, you know, he has a 100% finish rate, whether it's uh, KOs or submissions, he's about split on those. And uh, I like I like this fight inside the distance just because I think Oliveira is going to get into a firefight in this fight, and I think that Rachmanov is going to welcome it in arms. Um, it's sitting at plus money right now, and I don't think it's a bad one to play, even though Oliveira has been going to decision recently. We're coming, we his opponent is not going to decision. He's right. a newcomer. He's so. going to try and make a statement out there. Right. If, uh, so, I mean, if, if Shavkat, I see him obviously getting inside the distance or blowing his wad in the first round, and, you know, then it taking a turn for Cowboy. Right. Yeah. And and so, so sitting like at that. plus money, it's, it's hard to pass up. Um, Rachmanov, you know, you, you talk. You mentioned a little bit about his his level of competition outside of it. He does have a win over John Young Park, who we mm-hmm. just saw dominate John Phillips. Now I think that was a, a young John Young Park, um, who was more of a boxing heavy approach, but um, it is notable. And then you know, I, I would hate for Oliveira to uh, realize that he's outmatched on the striking in the striking range as well, because if he shoots for a takedown, Rapinov makes a living on, on wrapping up people's necks that are shooting for a takedown. So that's another one that I wouldn't necessarily want to test out. Rachmanov, he has great trips inside the clinch. And, uh, you know, you mentioned his, his M1 Global experience. He's no he's no uh, uh, amateur when it comes to being in the spotlight right. in, a, in an event. So uh, I really do like him sitting at plus money right now. I think that it's a, a good one to take. But rather than, than bank on this newcomer that we don't know much about, I'd bank on this being a shit show and it not seeing the judges now. I like that as well, man. Freeland main event. I know this is one you're pumped for. I am pumped for it. No, no, this is one that we kind of see, don't see eye to eye on, and neither do these guys. They don't see eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan Stroob is a uh, seven foot um, and an 84 inch reach. The only guy in the UFC that matches John Jones's reach. And uh, Tai Tai Avasa, six two with a 75 inch reach. There's a nine and a half inch reach disadvantage for Tai Avasa. Um, now, Stefan Struve, he's been in the UFC since 2009. Um, that in and of itself is pretty incredible. And for him to only be 32 years old right now, um, I think that he's had the time to learn a lot. And for me, I don't really count fights that are not within a half a decade. If it's if it's over five years, I don't like to look or don't like to put too much weight on those just because I hope that if you're in the UFC for that long that you're making those improvements, especially at how young Stefan Struve was whenever he was facing those losses. Um, there are some obvious holes in Stefan Struve's game. He has always had trouble with an overhand right or power puncher, both of which tied to Avasa is. Um, that being said, Stefan Struve has the second most submission wins in heavyweight in UFC heavyweight history. He has 18 submission wins, six of those being in the UFC. And I really do think that that's that's how that's how I see it getting done. Taito Ibasa probably worse than Derek Lewis on the ground. Uh, he's he's quoted saying that his uh, his favorite grappling technique is the get up and. That speaks for itself. I think to Avasa, unless it's a first round KO, he starts to slow down. He he does not look good, and his only decision, his only fight that uh, he's won outside of the first round was his decision went to Andre Arblowski, which was you know iffy in itself. Iffy in itself, yeah. Um, he's coming off of the loss to Sergey Spivak, who absolutely dominated him and the odds makers definitely didn't think that coming into it two of us that came into that fight as a minus 410 and it did not show at all i mean he was outclassed from the moment that fight started um you know some some things that work into a boss's favor is he has some murderous leg kicks i mean they will buckle anybody and that's something that Stefan Struve is extremely susceptible to at seven foot tall um, he also has a nice overhand right, but outside of that, I think he's outclassed pretty much everywhere against Stefan Struve. I think Struve, in that Ben Rothwell fight, he was put, he was the one setting the pace. He was the one dominating the exchanges in that fight. And until 
Uh, shot. Yeah, and Phil Rothwell kicked him in the nuts two times, and Dan Merkliata more or less, you know, coaxed Seth and Struve to start up earlier than he should have. Struve was on the path to victory right there, and I really think that that speaks to his um, his uh, improvement as a fighter as he's moved forward in his UFC career. Um, you know, I say that, but last year he fought Mar- Marcos Rogerio de Lima, who he subbed in round two. But that was after getting caught with the first throw, the first shot that Marcus threw, which was an overhand right that caught him on the chin. Yes, he's seven foot, and yes, he has tall man defense. But hopefully, he can um, try and address those, like he did in the Ben Rockwell fight, and beat somebody who's amateur everywhere but being a brawler and tied to a bossa. So, uh, you know, Stefan Struve sitting at a minus one fifteen, minus one ten. I'll take him all day, and I've already played that as a personal bet, but I know that we don't see eye to eye. Yeah, so this is one that we don't see eye to eye, and I've already cashed a personal bet. Well, I haven't cashed. I've placed a personal bet that it's going to cash on Saturday already. A tie to a boss at the plus 110 underdog, and, man, you you really hit the nail uh, on the head, man, with both of these guys. Struve, um, from the looks of this guy, he's a champ, bro. He's beat the champ, you know, and... You just don't know what Stefan Struve you're going to get. And as of late, lost four of his last five and being dropped in the one win he has. I mean, we haven't seen the Stefan Struve lately that, um, you know, has been in, in top form. Everybody subs Marcos de Lima, you know. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to speak just too negatively about the guy because he's an absolute vet. Uh, but, man, the chin is just, it's in question. Um with some guys, and and Ty is some guy who absolutely cracks people, you know, coming out of the Mark Hunt camp and stuff. He's a brawler, man, and stylistically-wise, I think Stefan Struve has to be perfect for 15 minutes. I I think he has to avoid all the shots that Ty is going to throw. Do I think Ty has 15 minutes of that in him? No, I don't. But the first round is going to be super, super dangerous. Um, I just... I think he's faster on the feet than Stefan Struve is. I think he's going to close the distance. Both of these guys need a win super, super bad here. Um, and just being the younger 27-year-old, I think Ty Tuovasa is maybe just in a better headspace on this one right here, in my opinion. Now, I think we actually, before the podcast, did come to a little compromise here, as, as I definitely think Tuovasa gets it done in the first round, and that sitting at, at first-round TKO was a plus 425. Whereas the Struve is a plus 275 for the submission. And we both really like those lines. So a sprinkle on both of those, um, and they hit, and you're profitable either way. So it's it's something definitely to take note of and something I think that uh, it might be released out there for you guys Saturday. But I think the odds, I think they're spot on, man. I, I really do. I think it's a pick em fight. Both of them have passed the victory. But um, this is heavyweights, man. And Stefan Struve has, has not proved to have the best to be. I agree 100%. Um, I really do like that we came to that compromise because, like you said, we are going to profit on it. Uh, 0.8 of the unit. If we put, put 0.5 on either of those lines, we're either going to profit 0.8 with Stefan Struve submission or 1.3 with the tie to a loss of first round knockout. I think that that's perfect. Too. So to kick off the pay-per-view, we start off with the rematch of Magomed Ankilov, who is 13-1, and versus Ion Kutelaba, who's 15-5. and um, This is one that I'm, you know, I guess I'm excited to see the rematch because that first stoppage was horrible, right. one of the worst in the UFC. Um, for those of you that didn't know, it was stopped by... Kutilaba more or less doing a, a rope-a-dope and acting like he was hurt and the ref stepping in prematurely and stopping mm-hmm. the fight. Um, that being said, Magomed landed a solid shot that actually did catch him to begin yeah. with. And, you know, I, I don't think resorting to a rope-a-dope game plan is anybody's, should be anybody's go-to plan in a fight like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ankulov, he's 13-1. and one. Realistically, I think he, he should be undefeated at 14-0, and 0, but he had a slip-up against Paul Craig, and Craig was able to to get a submission over him in the last second of the third round. Literally, literally the last second. Right. Um, that being said, Magomed, outside of, of that one slip-up, he's never faced much resistance in the UFC. He's never been less than a minus 205 in his six UFC fights. 
and this one it doesn't change any either. He's sitting at a minus 300 right now, and I think rightfully so. Um, it's you know it's kind of annoying that these two are getting rescheduled again, just because I think Ankyalov could have been facing much better UFC yeah. talent and showcasing his skills rather than trying to get this matchup that I don't think was that close to begin with. And honestly, it's not like super exciting for me, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Ankyalov he has crisp, straight striking. He throws all of his strikes with bad intentions. And, uh, you know, he has incredible top pressure, just like any Russian fighter that you've seen in the UFC. Uh, I know that he was awarded his Master of Sports in MMA by Fedor Emelianenko, and that's got to be one of the biggest achievements a Russian can have. Um, on the flip side, Kutelaba, he's 4-4 four and four in the UFC with three of his four wins, the, the three fighter, three of the fighters that he's beaten, Jonathan Martinez, Hin, uh Henrique da Silva and probably Gadzin Murad and Tegulov are all on their way out of the UFC or already out of the UFC. So there's not much weight that you can hold even with his wins, you know? So uh, I just, I'm not too high on Kutilaba. He has losses to Misha Serkinov, Jared Cannonier, who's now a 185er, Khalil Roundtree, and Glover Deshera. I think that he is a gatekeeper of the light heavyweight division, and it's going to stay that way for years to come. Um, him being only 26 years old, he has a lot of time to improve, but um, if he doesn't get his get technique under his belt and a little bit of patience, I think that he's going to continue to see the results that he's been getting. Um, Kutalaba, that being said, he'll throw some wild stuff. He has a spinning back fist. Mm-hmm. He has some... some uh, some crazy shots that he's able to throw and and when he does he throws them to kill you you know he's throwing with a hundred percent power and we see that we see that in his fights where he starts to slow down after that first round he really does have about a round of a gas tank and then you start to see him tail off um that being said that first round he's athletic as anybody and really anything could happen especially at the light heavyweight division I just don't see Ankulov having another slip up like he did in the Paul Craig fight. I see this being pretty one sided and one that we'll probably put in a parlay. Right, so I'm right there with you, man. Uh, this is, you know, had that crazy ending. Now it's like the fourth time re- being rebooked. And just one thing I noticed is so the first rebooking was came, Ankulov came out as a minus 360. And then they rebooked it a second time, and it's a minus 320. And now they rebook it again. And the opening line when it first opened up was, I think you could snag it somewhere around a minus 278, 280. And it's like, I think Ankalov, I think you can agree, he definitely landed a clean shot on uh, on Kutelaba there. And rope it up or not, he was hurt probably for a second. And I just don't know what has changed to get that line to drop even even that much, you know, even right. to the minus 300 where it's at now. Like, what has Kutelaba done differently over this COVID that's that's dropped this line? I, I think he's outclassed on the feet. I think he's outclassed on the mat. I think he's outclassed cardio-wise. You touched on him blowing his wad in the first round all the time. The later this goes, the way more I favor um, Magomed Ankalov. And so you touched on Ion at 26. That's super young too, man, but... Ankalov's only 28 years old um, and already got the number 11 next to his name. I think that's a guy that – I don't know if he's going to touch gold one day, but that guy's going to be um, in the top 15 for years and years mm-hmm. to come. Um, and, man, those – you know, the Kutelaba wins, they don't hold much weight anymore. They're out of the UFC. All those comp- opponents' combined record is now 4-8. and eight. Um, They just don't hold a lot of weight anymore where – I think a lot of man just has a ceiling that's uh, almost untouchable. I, I see this guy being a, a really big problem for a lot of guys in the light heavyweight division. Um, these neither one of these guys tend to go to decision hardly at all. I don't think this one goes to decision, and I'm pretty sure the odds will reflect that as well. Probably mm-hmm. some out of range to play, but. We definitely agree with you, man. Ankle is going to get this one done and probably going to parlay that one on Saturday. And then uh, we have our uh, female fight here on the main card. And Lauren Murphy, who's the number eight flyweight, fighting the newcomer in Liliana Shakarova. Shakarova, the newcomer who's eight and one. And I don't really, man, I don't even want to spend too much time on this one, in my opinion. Lauren Murphy, um, at 37 years old, has kind of turned her career around, in my opinion. And she, uh, she was two and five to start in the UFC, and uh, now she's ripped off three wins in a row, including ones over like KGB and stuff. So I mean, the girls turned her career around big time. She was supposed to fight uh, Cynthia Calvillo, and she was like a plus one eighty dog, and 
Cynthia Calvillo is super suspect. I might have played Lauren Murphy at a plus 180 dog in that mm-hmm. fight, but now you got her as a minus 240 against the newcomer in only parlay playable in my opinion. It's 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 way too uh, far out of reach, but she she has great takedown defense, and that's something that's super slept on about her. And I think she's going to need it in this fight. The the girl has serious grappling skills, uh, but she is making her promotional debut. And the last girl she just beat is only one and one. Um, and what you see in newcomers all the time taking on short notice, you, you see him kind of gas out in the first round after just the excitement, the butterflies, the grappling heavy approach he's probably going to come with. Um, I, di- I just got to lean toward Lauren, Lauren Murphy here, and I really like parlaying her with Ankalov or Dada, uh, John, Da Eun Jung or yeah. something, one of those two. Uh, I, I'm totally with you. I think the resurgence in Murphy's career is somewhat notable, especially with the level of talent that she's competing with. Um, whether she's getting it done by split decision or not, the wins over uh, Mara Bor- uh, Barella, Andrea Lee, and Roxy, those are all notable mm-hmm. and something that – uh, Shakarova hasn't even come close to touching. Uh, you touched on her uh, Shakarova's last fight being against a girl who was one and one. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a her one before that was against a girl who was two and one. And in her entire eight and one career, she hasn't beaten a girl better than five and zero. Oh. And just to just to touch on that girl who was five and zero, oh, her name was uh, Igol Karabrova, who doesn't have a win over anybody with more than three fights. So. Yeah. Realistically, the level of competition is it's apples to oranges. There's really no comparisons to being being made. Um, I think Shakarova, you know, you touched on her takedown ability. She's a freestyle wrestling national champion, mm-hmm. and uh, she really does look extremely good when, in her entries, and she's really good at tripping girls up. But that being said, I think that she's pretty undersized for the flyweight division at five foot three, yeah. and not necessarily carrying a lot of muscle like. Uh, Jessica Andrade could make up for right. um, where Lauren Murphy you know she's going to be physically stronger than most flyweights that she competes with she's an ex Invicta Bantamweight champion and has wins in featherweight so she's going to be the much stronger person she eats punches for breakfast she does, and yeah. it realistically I, I see Lauren Murphy dominating in this especially on a short notice fight um, there are a couple of things that Murphy kind of struggles with. I think that when it comes to speed, she struggles with it. And if Shakarova is able to get it to the ground, Lauren Murphy is just almost content with being on her back. And she's lost a couple of rounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I look towards the Sajara Eubanks fight where she's just too comfortable being on her back. And it, it, there's not enough motivation for her to get to her feet. And that sometimes costs her. But hopefully... Um, She'll, you know, she'll continue from what we've seen in her last three fights and just coast this one out the victory. I think that she's somebody that we can play because she's not unproven by any means. If anything, she's shown us that she is able to uh, improve as she moves forward and right now is at the top of her game, even at 37 years old. Um, all right, so moving forward, we go to middleweight. Again, these last two fights... We, me and you have talked about it. I don't know if either one of them should be on the main card. Right. There are plenty of fights on the prelims. Two of Asa and Struve and Casey Kinney and you know or Alex Oliveira yeah, and any, plenty of fights we could have replaced for but, sure. Uh, Jacob uh, Malkoon is is the boy of one of the guys up here, so I think right. that's just a gimme. So so we have Phil Megatron Hawes, who's coming in off the Dana White Contender Series win over uh, Kadzimora. Kadzimora at Bestiav with an overhand right to ground and pound um, versus Jacob Malcone, who's 4-0 in his in, in his career as an MMA practitioner and I, I really I, uh, I just I can't I can't get over how this is a main card fight you know um, Phil Hawes he's a he's a one round fighter himself he's got a hundred percent finish rate and he has obvious gas tank issues whenever he's yeah. in the cage um, he is a, a JUCO national champ from Iowa in wrestling, and he relies on that pretty heavy. He does. Um, he, that being said, he's probably had the, you know, he's worked with some of the best athletes the UFC has to offer, whether it's John Jones, Kamar Usman, uh, Derek Brunson, Michael Chandler. He's worked with them all. Cerrone, so, all of them. Yeah, I, I know that he's picking up some really useful skills, even in his short stint as an MMA fighter. Yeah. Um, Jacob Malcone, you know, it's hard to even look up his name without getting uh, 
him being friends with Robert Whitaker just blasted in your yeah. face. Like, uh, yes, Robert Whitaker corners him usually. Um, no, I don't think Malcone is is worthy of being in the UFC right now. And Much less this Highland pay per view. Right, right. I, I think that man, if if this fight goes out of the first round, we could really see a, a Kimbo Dada type fight. Right. You know. Um, that being said, Jacob Malcone, he does uh, resort to wrestling in his fights. I, I don't think that he's going to be able to out-wrestle Phil Hawes, but um, he at least has some grappling experience, and then he's also 3-0 and as a boxer, so I think that he'll have the edge on the on the feet as well. So I lean towards uh, Megatron to get this done, but this is a trap fight, if you yeah. ask me. This is an absolute trap fight for me as well, one that I'm passing altogether. Hawes? Just one of those guys the UFC is, just won't give up on, in my opinion. You know, he's gotten two runs in Dana White Contender Series. Um, and he trains out of those big gyms. With, you know, he's good friends with all these big guys. But he's just one of those guys that, you know, I think they hype him up in the gym and he has problems delivering on fight night, you know. Deron Wynn. Deron Wynn, man. I mean, Donald Cerrone has of late and stuff. When mm-hmm. it comes to fight night, I don't know if it's the butterflies or something, but he, he just doesn't put it together the way he should. Um and that loss on Dana White's contender series to Julian Marquez was absolutely filthy. That is a highlight real knockout still being played, man. I still screamed rewatching that fight when right. he got knocked out. Uh, I, I've shown that knockout to I don't know how many people. You want to see an MMA knockout, I'm, I'm pulling up Julian Marquez because that is filthy. He talked on the wrestling, um, and that's exactly what type of fighter he is. He's got a big overhand right, and he's got a super, super powerful double, he- double leg. Both, which... You know, I think are better than what Jacob Malkoon brings to the table. Malkoon, though, a little bit more uh, patient. You don't see him blow his wide like you have seen Phil do multiple times. We've actually seen Malkoon fight to a decision for 15 minutes. So the later it goes, um, if Phil Hawes hasn't got him out of there, Malkoon may make this a dirty, scrappy fight. You know, it's a fight that, like I said, staying away from altogether. But um, I, I battle back and forth with did he get this spot because he's Robert's super good friend or um is phil hall is just one of those people that they're really high on this is a gimme fight for him but either way man um i like phil halls to get this one done um but it is a trap yeah 100 percent. i think we both are picking halls for this yeah. one and man a fight that i know i'm super excited for here you have the number seven heavyweight in alexander volkov who's 31 and 8 fighting number 10 heavyweight in walt harris who's 13 and 8 and Odds man from where they open stayed about the exact same. So opened at a minus 175. Volkov is still sitting at a minus 170. Harris plus 145 dog when they open, and he's a plus 150 dog. So not much movement on those lines at all. Um, and I'm completely all right with the odds because in heavyweights, there's always that chance, you know. Um, so I don't like them being two or three to one, you know, getting up there. But a minus the 170, I think Volkov is twice the striker um, that Walt Harris is. Um, we've seen him test it over 15 minutes. Um, something Walt's really not known for being uh, mm-hmm. good at. You know, uh, you got you got him coming off the loss to Blades. Um, and I don't really want to say his wrestling's exposed because who has Blades not done that to? Right. Um, you know, outside of Francis Ngannou where he got caught with a big hand, you know, a big punch. He's done that to absolutely everybody. Um, and at the big frame Volkov had, it was just stylistically a bad fight for him. But that fight in the fifth, late fourth and fifth got super interesting when Curtis started to gas. And you had Volkov almost put him away and, and take him down himself. So people sleep on Volkov's grappling ability. This was a Bellator champion for a while and stuff. He's He's got some serious uh, skills, man. So I just think he's twice the striker. I think at a minus 170 price tag, um, it, it's too hard for me to pass up. I um, It's one of those where, you know, Walt Harris has to land the big shot, and you think Volkov has to be perfect for over 15 minutes, and I just don't think that's the case, man, because I don't think Walt Harris has more than you know than a round really in him, maybe a round and a half. But I think Volkov's really good at knees to the body and the clinch, um, and he, he really fights behind a hard, stiff jab, man. And hmm. I think all these problems are really going to cause Walt Harris some issues. Now, um, Walt is maybe one of the most athletic heavyweights, if not you know on the roster, but man, he's he's already thirty seven years old. He's thirteen and eight, been finished in five of those eight losses. So, you know, he's he's not 
unfamiliar with getting knocked out and stuff. And I, I just think he's outclassed on the feet here, man. He's really he can't. I don't think he can rely on the um, the one shot like Derek Lewis got lucky with. I think he's going to have to to really put in some combos to get past the guard and stuff of Volkov. And this fight, you know, I watched an interview with. Walt Harris talking about how he's went back to the drawing board and changed some things up and stuff, and it's like, I don't know what Walt Harris can change up um, that's not going to play into the you know the, the style of Volkov. Is he going to come out there and be more patient and try to fight at range with Volkov? It's it's not going to go well, you know. It's this it's, it's going to remind me of Israel and, and Paulo Costa. It, Costa had to do what he did to everybody and storm storm them and land a hook. He decided he was not going to do that. He was going to play the cardio safe and stand at range, and he got absolutely picked apart. And I really see that probably, um, you know, happening in this fight too. So if I can't talk you into it, it's going to, without a doubt, be a personal play for me, man. Yeah, so, you know, let me start off by saying I also lean towards Volkov, but I really like making an argument for Walt Harris here. Um, you know, Volkov, he's 1-2 and two in his last three. He's fought one time a year since that KO loss to Derek Lewis, and it was a bad KO loss, yeah. you know. Um, I know you talk about uh, Derek Lewis, you know, kind of getting lucky. I think he got lucky yeah. as well. Um, but there was one slip up in 15 minutes, and it made Volkov pay. Uh, now, if we know anything about Walt Harris, you know, he's a southpaw with some slick striking. He's a Golden Gloves winner in Alabama and mm-hmm. Florida. And if this fight was just a boxing match, I think he could be in some trouble. But it's not. It's MMA. And Volkov really does hide behind that long jab at an 80-inch reach really well. He also uses front kicks that'll keep people at bay and keep them at, at distance. Mm-hmm. And if you don't set up your takedowns with strikes to begin with, he reads those really well. And it's tough to take somebody who's six foot seven down if you're not uh, coming in with a with a, a solid takedown attempt as opposed to uh, just shooting from across the cage. Now, um, Volkov, he he does have problems with overhand overhand rights. Like even in a lot of his wins, uh, he gets caught with overhand rights. And the Greg Hardy win, he got caught with a couple of good shots from Greg Hardy, although. Hardy didn't have much shine in those or in that fight. Um, Walt Harris, you know, I like to. There's a couple of fights that I like to draw comparisons to. One was his last time out against Alistair Overeem. Um, shoot, man, I think a lot of refs would have stopped that fight, and thankfully it wasn't. We got to see Alistair Overeem, you know, withstand the, the initial barrage of punches mm-hmm. from Walt Harris. But realistically, Walt Harris had him where he wanted him, and most refs would have stopped it. So I don't know how much he would need to change. And then, you know, you can you can draw comparisons of Volkov striking to Alistair Overeem. Mm-hmm. I think Alistair may be the best heavyweight striker that we've ever seen, and Walt Harris was able to implement his striking offense and and almost finish him, right. you know. And then an- another person is just somebody who you can draw height comparisons to, Daniel Spitz who isn't doesn't hold a fucking torch to Alexander Volkov by any means but he's six foot seven and that's a a fight where you got to see a patient Walt Harris that knocked him out with uh, you know less than a minute left in the second round and still looked good like I think that he could have fought that third round and still had a pretty decent output Um, I, I think that Walt Harris is sitting is sitting right where he needs to be as far as odds are but it's just one that you know I, I don't know if there's value on either fighter and if we do end up playing Volkov um, it's not a confident one for me it's just kind of a you know maybe put a unit to win a half unit type deal and I, I guess I'd be I'd, I'd be comfortable doing that but Walt Harris really does have a shot in that opening round first round first and second round all right, so moving on to the co-main event. This is the fight that I am most excited about, I think, even over the main event. Um, we got the killer gorilla, Jared Cannonier at 13-4, and four, fighting the Reaper, Robert Whitaker, at 21-5. and five. I get pretty, uh, you know, I, I get... I'm pretty worked up that Robert Whitaker is at plus money right yeah. now. I think if this fight would have come before the KO loss to Izzy, Whitaker would be sitting at a minus 400 right now. He's getting extremely disrespected, and after coming off of a loss or a win over Darren Till, and I think that that Darren Till says a lot about where Robert Whitaker is right now. You know, a lot of people are are weighing are putting a lot of weight on his. 
uh, tough career being in wars with Yoel Romero and, and getting knocked out by Izzy and getting dropped by Till. But we saw, you know, Whitaker bounce back from that, from the uh, Izzy KO beating Till. Now he did get dropped, but he showed that he's still a champion by, by, you know, going to his fundamentals right after that and then dropping Darren Till and then coasting out a victory. I mean, he's still the Robert, the Reaper, Robert Whitaker in my book. And I, I really, I really think that Jared Cannonier kind of has uh, a one-dimensional offense. You know, he he started his career at heavyweight where he was one and one, then moved to light heavyweight where he was two and three, and is now on a three-fight win streak at middleweight. But let's take a little deeper dive into that middleweight run. He's beaten a, you know, a. Uh, 36-year-old David Branch at the mm-hmm. time and a 44-year-old uh, Spider Anderson Silva. Um, if you don't beat those guys and you've had the runs like he had at heavyweight and light heavyweight, you're probably out of the UFC. So God forbid he doesn't win those fights. And, and then, you know, his Jack Hermanson win, definitely the biggest win of his career. And I think Hermanson is a top middleweight, but if Hermanson can't get you to the mat and at least implement some ground and pound or a submission win, he's fucked on the feet. Yeah. And so Cannoneer being as strong as he is, yeah, he was able to, he was able to, to get up, but Hermanson had his back at one point, um, got a takedown really, really early. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think that Jared Cannoneer's only advantage in this fight is his strength where Robert Whitaker has the speed the fight IQ the technique the movement he he has him beat in every aspect of the of this game other than the power and I don't think that him coming off of a recent win over Till who has just as much power in my opinion as as Cannoneer and maybe even more offensive tools than Cannoneer that you can have the that Whitaker at plus money right now. That's something that I've personally played really, really heavy, and I, you know, I hope that we can agree that that that's where the value is right there. Yeah, man. So I'm so hype on this coming event, and I I kind of took some shit for a while, but Robert's been my dude for a long time, man. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, even through all the injuries and stuff, Robert's some guy that I've stuck by, man. I he was probably the first one of those guys that went up a weight class and found success and really started a movement for a lot of guys, you know. Um, this fight for me, it's... Uh, I feel like this fight right here really controls um, the Izzy and Jones fight because if Cannonier wins this, I think we see Izzy stay at 185 and defend his belt. But I think if Robert Whitaker wins this fight, I think we see Israel go up and fight Jan Blachowicz to try to get that light heavyweight belt to entice Jones to come back down. Um, it's hard for me to to see Robert getting another shot at Izzy after being dropped in the first round and finished in the second, or you know, dropped again and finished in the second round. So with just two fights in between, it's it's hard for me to maybe see them giving Robert the shot again immediately. You know. Mm-hmm. That being said, you touched on it, brother. Robert's better everywhere except for the power that being said you know we saw him drop twice against easy we saw him drop against twice against till i think jared cannonier has more power than 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 till and uh israel put together to be honest with you he's a physical specimen at 185 and um i think coming down from heavyweight he's really brought some of that power down with him at 185 and i don't want to knock the till loss or anything or the till win but Till's kind of an an overweight 170 year. This is this is a guy who's finally found his weight class. Who's you know been at 265 and been at 205. He's 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 gonna bring like he's fought guys way bigger than Rob, and he's gonna bring some power in here that I don't think Rob has felt, especially used to being a 170 year. Mm-hmm. Um, Cannoneer since being at 85, and I don't want to say maybe just being at 85. I think he was. I think he was just, you know, premature in his MMA career, couldn't find his weight class. I think he's found his home here at 85, and I think we see him improve in all these fights that we've seen him take at 185. Being said, man, both Branch and Hermanson steamrolled him the first 30 seconds and took his back, and he really had to have the fuck you Derek, Derek Lewis strength to get up. Do I see Robert coming out here and doing that to him? No, but I do think Robert is a better wrestler, can control him up against the fence, some can wear on him and and make him carry that muscle later into the rounds. I don't see Robert finishing this fight. I think it's to a decision, but I think he has all the tools in his toolbox to to really outpoint Cannoneer to a decision. 
Um, and at plus money, when we saw it earlier in the week at plus 105, um, I'm jumping all that on there with you, brother. I, uh, that's my boy, and uh, I'm so glad to see him, you know, back into the spotlight again and stuff after a, a pretty big loss on a big stage in front of everybody there to Israel. 100%. Now, just to touch on a few more, Jared Cannonier, you know, since moving to 185, all of his wins are by first or second round KO. Mm-hmm. So I would like to see Robert Whitaker you know, take him into those deep waters where we've seen him go 25 minutes against, again, I, I think somebody who probably is more powerful than Cannoneer and Yoel right. Romero. And he did that two different times. So we know he has the gas tank for it. We know he's seen power similar, at least to, to Cannoneer, what he brings in. And then Whitaker, man, he's got an awkward offense. You he know? does. And he, I don't think he's going to be there for that calf kick and stuff or the leg kick that Jared loves to land. Right. He bounces movement. whenever yeah. he's in there. And, and he can sl- uh, sneak in that left hook and catch anybody. And I don't know if Cannoneer's really seen that level of striking mm-hmm. um, in the middleweight division yet. Now, you know, I, I say that, and Anderson Silva is a legend and the, one of the best strikers to ever do it, but at 44 years oh, old. Going over him is not impressive anymore. Right. No, it, it really is I expect isn't. the top middleweights to beat him. And, and then, you know, Along with Whitaker's awkward striking that I think that he will be able to implement against Jared Cannonier, I think that he also has the wrestling background to fall back on. I don't think Cannonier is going to be able to take him down if he doesn't have success on the feet. And, man, I really do think it's just crazy that we're getting these type of odds for Robert Whitaker. So I'm happy that we're both in on this. Uh, my lock of the night right there. You know? Nice. Man, it's our main event of the evening. We have the undefeated Habib Nurmagomedov, 28-0. Facing the interim champ and Justin Gaethje, who's twenty-two and two. Um, Gaethje, man, I guess you finally got your equal that you've been asking for this whole time. You got you a tough fight. That being said, they currently got Khabib at a minus three thirty-five favorite to the comeback when Justin Gaethje at a minus, or I'm sorry, at a plus two seventy-five, and um, you know that is already almost in playable range, even if you don't think Justin Gaethje is going to win this fight. Um, but I'm going to tell you. Khabib has more money come on him than fight night than any other fighter in UFC history. Um, and they, um, I, there is, he's notorious for being parlayed with NFL teams and stuff come Saturday night because he comes around as being such a big favorite and supposed to win. So, man, I, uh, I think come fight night, I think we get a more than plus 300 on Justin Gaethje. And, again, I'm just going to go ahead and say I think Khabib's going to win. But in the business of making money, that's odds that are almost un, you know it's unheard of. You've got Khabib making his fourth main event walk, while Justin Gaethje is making his seventh main event walk for the UFC in just eight fights. Um, he means the highlight, just like his nickname, and he's been in the spotlight, a main event from his very first UFC fight. Um, I just before I go into the question marks surrounding Khabib's camp and stuff, I I, I gotta talk. I just gotta talk him up so much, man. There there's not a guy. Um, He's arguably the best fighter that's ever lived. I I hate that he beat our boy and Connor, but he's going for 30 0, he's 28 0, and he has no asterisks by his record or anything. So, you know, I know we'll talk back and forth about Jones and him, but there's zero asterisks by his name and stuff, man. It's hard to see Khabib um, as not being the greatest ever, and he's lost like one round in his entire career. It's just. He, this guy pressures you like nobody else. He puts you up against the fence, and his chain wrestling is off the charts. If if you stop the single leg, he's going for a double leg. He's going for a high crotch. He's got trips, you know, like whatever attack that you think you can stop of Khabib, there's something else he's going to throw at you. He has, you know, he has Dustin Poirier coming back to the corner and saying, I can't get this man off me. You know, it, it's a different level of grappling. Um, the Dagestani handcuff, he mounts you, he ties your legs up underneath his feet. There's so many techniques that Khabib has brought into the MMA grappling scene that are now being used so widely by everybody else. His technique, man, is, it's just beyond anybody else. Being said, man, the question marks are there with his dad and stuff. And his dad was his rock. It's his, his best friend, coach, trainer, and is Khabib 100% focused? I told you earlier, is Khabib, is he training with a bear? Is he is he swimming upstream in 30-degree rivers? Is he running that extra mile that you know his dad's going to make him run? It's You don't know how focused Khabib is going to be. And on the other end, I think it's criminal to have anybody 3-1 to one favorite over Justin Gaethje, especially as good as he's looked lately. That guy has really found his groove, and 
he went to Trevor Whitman and said, man, I'm, I'm ready to turn in those performance bonuses for the strap. And mm-hmm. we've really seen a much more composed Justin Gaethje who was not getting into wars. The, the Tony fight, I, I mean, man, it, it absolutely blew my mind, to be honest with you. That was a, that was a completely different Justin Gaethje and one that went out there with a, a five round game plan in order to beat Tony Ferguson. And he's going to have to come out there with the same game plan because he's, going to get worked by Khabib, man. Khabib's going to make him use some of that energy. He's not just going to be able to stay in the boxing range for 25 minutes. I, I'm, I'm with you. It's hard to count out Khabib, who's uh, dropped one round, right. an, an arguable round, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the only the only exception, I guess, and I know it's annoying to bring up, but the Gleason T. Bow fight, right. you know, it's it's not a pre-USADA anymore, mm-hmm. you know, and I think as far as the strength advantage, Khabib has a strength advantage over everybody at 155. Um, that being said, he's never come into a, a fight less than a minus 200 favorite. And realistically, I'm with you. I think that that's probably where he should be sitting against Justin Gaethje. I yeah. think that they're really disrespecting Justin Gaethje with the plus 275 and up odds. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is a live dog, especially... I think that the best thing working in Justin Gaethje's favor is the unknowns. You know, he's never had to use his uh, grapple. He's never had to use his grappling in the UFC, and uh, it, that really I think works into his advantage because what's Habib really going to be able to look at right. other than fights from half a decade ago? Mm-hmm. So, you know, Gaethje he really does live up to his name. The highlight, you know, eighteen of his eighteen of his twenty two wins are by KO and. He is a fan favorite for a reason. Um, I think that, you know, everybody talks about how Habib can go uh, the full 25 minutes and then take another fight. Well, Justin Gaethje showed in his last fight and him moving to team elevation in Denver, it makes me believe that his cardio is not going to be in question at all either. Now, you know, I say that, but that's because he's never had to, he's never been held on the ground for four rounds he either. He never had to scramble the way he's going to have to scramble on Saturday. Right, 100%. And so I, I got to think, even though Habib's dad is now gone, um, that he's going to stick to the Habib game plan that it's always been, and that's just to get it to the ground, hold him, and implement his game plan, not try and get into a stand-up war, which I know Justin Gaethje would welcome, mm-hmm. but I can't imagine Habib wavering from that from his path to victory that's given him 28 wins in a row. Um, there is one thing that I could see happening. Let's say Gaethje, you know, because we don't know, let's say he does stuff a few of Khabib's takedowns. Um, Habib has a lead uppercut that I think would sneak right through Justin Gaethje's high guard. And if it does, um, you know, every round starts standing. And if Khabib does try and implement some type of striking offense, I think that he'll throw that and have some success with it. Justin likes to just tuck in everything yeah. and not really look what's in front of him. And I think that Khabib really could sneak that in, that combat Sambo lead uppercut. So you touched on uh, the shelling up and the defense there. I think I think that opens the double leg for Khabib just too easily and mm-hmm. stuff. And Gaethje really has to come in here and make significant changes to improve and to, to keep on the path that he's on now because, I mean, man, you know, it doesn't – MMA doesn't add – you know, math doesn't add up. And this was a couple years ago. But, I mean, he's lost to Dustin. He's lost to Eddie. And, you know, we, we've seen what Dustin gets done to by Khabib and stuff. It's, it's hard for me to say Justin's going to win this. Um, but at, at a plus 300, man, you never know. It's a fight, and there's so many question marks surrounding Khabib with his dad, with Umar pulling out, or with if it, who it was. Uh, yeah, Umar. Umar with, um, what's his name, pulling out at Makachev mm-hmm. as well, pulling out. It's There's so many question marks with uh, Khabib there, man. And, and over a year layoff for uh, yeah, him as well. Yeah, a year layoff while Gaethje has just been on fire lately. Well, you know, a couple things Gaethje does do well is the calf kicks, and you know, do you want to throw those kicks on somebody like Khabib who's threatened you so much with the takedown? So, And I, I think that the answer to that is yes. I mean, especially the low calf kick that Justin's just known, known for. for. Um, he needs three. Yeah, yeah, he needs three. <laughs> and it's something that, you know, you can utilize against a, a wrestler because it's not, you know, it's not a, a body kick or right. a high kick that they can, you can know, catch, catch and, mm-hmm. and, you, and get the takedown. But, you know, with the amount of speed that Justin Gaethje throws on it, I think as the fight progresses, his chances deplete. I'm with you. Uh, you know? I'm with you there, man. So uh, right before I looked in the under four and a half rounds in this as a minus 170. So you got to pay for it a little bit. But 
I think it's a, I think it's a good play, man. Justin has been finished in his other two. His two losses, he's been finished. He's finished 18 of his 22 wins. And, and unless you're Tony Ferguson, uh, you're not making it out of that fourth round right. uh, not getting knocked out by Gaethje. I know. If Khabib takes any of those shots, he's getting finished. And if Khabib does what he's done to everybody else, he's getting the finish. Mm-hmm. So at a minus 170 price tag, that's still, like you said, you got to pay for it, but still in playable range for me, man. 100%. So that does wrap up the night fights for the night, man. Um Go ahead and talk about your fight of the night if you'd like. Okay. Fight of the night. I'm going to lean with... Oh. Oh. All right. I'm going to think. I'm gonna say that the fight of the night, and I, I think it'll get the bonus for fight of the night if the if the main event doesn't, mm-hmm. um, is the Cowboy Oliveira yeah. and Shav, uh, Shavkat Rachmanov. I think that that's going to be an absolute war, regardless of who wins that... Uh, that inside the distance is at plus money, and I think that, that that's where it's at right there. Uh, yeah, man, so I was all over that one too, but don't want to use the same one. The co-main event, man, Rob and, and Jared, that's going to be my fight of the night. Both of those guys are tough as nails. You know, you you have the preview of the fight. You have Cannoneer talking about just bringing a war, and then it cuts to Rob saying, I've been in wars, mate. It's right. so hype, dude. These guys are going, their guys are going to swing on each other. They're going to war on Saturday night. Um, I think Robert's going to show us the championship status there, man. So definitely my fight of the night there. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with fighter to watch, man. I can't make it not be Habib, man, you know, with, with all the question marks and losing his dad. if Is he going to come out and solidify the 29-0, and do the 30-0 and like his dad wanted him to and retire? Um, Khabib's got a lot to live up to on Saturday, um, you know, with a lot of people in doubt about him. So, without a doubt, man, I got to go with watching Khabib on Saturday. Nice. Uh, I think I'm going to go with Stefan Struve. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's fighting for his job right now. Yep. Same with Tuavasa, but I think Stefan Struve, he has the tools to beat Tuavasa. I just need him to prove me right. Yeah. You know, just and needs to let the IQ come together. Right, you know? right. Uh, quit with the tall man defense and, and do what you do best, and that's submission. So, I, I want to keep an eye on Stefan Struve. That'll be the one I will for sure not miss. So, make sure you guys like and subscribe. Now you get to see what the poster looks like, so throw all the comments in. You guys chat it up down there. Any person who's down there, we are going to put you on the in the raffle for the for the poster here. And as always, follow us on Twitter. Our bets are always tracked at Bet MMA, and we're hoping for a big comeback this week, man. Yes, sir. So hoping you guys are cashing with us. Take care. Peace.